Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to our commemoration of the centenary of the ascension of Abdul Baha. This is the fifth of our PG town hall meetings and we have a wonderful program of stories, writings, prayers and songs and we welcome you to share yours with us. This November, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha. The Universal House of Justice has given us a bounteous glimmering of their planning. Our team has been consulting about local efforts that can help us prepare day by day for that anniversary. Each of us can make a personal commitment to learn more about Abdul Baha. We can participate telling favorite stories about Abdul Baha's life and then share them with friends. We can incorporate stories and writings of Abdul Baha into our core activities. We can invite friends to town hall style gatherings where participants share writings and life stories of Abdul Baha. Tonight, we will open with a prepared program of stories and writings from the Ascension of Baha'u'llah in 1892 to 1901, when Abdul Baha is confined to Akka once again. Attendees are then invited to share stories and quotes. They can be from other years and other authors, but should help us better understand Abdul Baha. This is an opportunity to practice telling a story from memory. He is God, O oh thou kind and beloved Lord. These friends are exhilarated with the wine of the covenant and are wanderers in the wilderness of thy love. Their hearts are consumed by the flames of remoteness from thee and they yearn eagerly for the revelation of thy splendors. From thine invisible kingdom, the realm of the unseen, reveal unto them the effulgent glory of thy grace and shed upon them the radiance of thy bounty. At every moment, send forth a new blessing and reveal a fresh favor. O divine providence, we are weak and thou art the most powerful. We are as tiny ants and thou art the king of the realm of glory. Bestow thy grace and confer thy bounty upon us that we may kindle a flame and shed its splendor abroad, that we may show forth strength and render some service. Grant that we may bring illumination to this darksome earth and spirituality to this fleeting world of dust. Suffer us not to rest for a moment, nor to devile ourselves with the transitory things of this life. Enable us to prepare a banquet of guidance, inscribe with our life blood the verses of love, leave fear and peril behind, become even as fruitful trees, and cause human perfections to appear in this ephemeral world. Thou in truth art the all bountiful, the most compassionate, the ever forgiving, the pardoner of Doha. We're going to begin with a summary of what was going on in the United States during the years 1892 to 1901, especially relating to people of African heritage. And then we will move to Abdu Baha in the Ottoman Empire. But after the Civil War ended in 1865, the next 12 years saw dramatic political and economic gains for African Americans as they were elected to local and national offices and established free public schools and colleges, just to name a few advances. But those opportunities faded with the end of Reconstruction just 12 years later in 1877. Between 1877 and 1890, despite overwhelming hostility, the standard of living for Southern freedmen and freedwomen rose steadily. 
African-American colleges like Howard, Morehead, Fisk, and Tuskegee produced a small but growing African-American middle class of professionals, doctors, lawyers, teachers. The 1890s brought a backlash of racial violence and political oppression aimed at erasing participation of African-Americans in politics and the economy. So I list three elements, there are many more. Disenfranchisement. Every Southern state passed laws designed specifically to prevent African-Americans from voting. Jim Crow laws. Every Southern state passed laws segregating public facilities into separate but equal. For instance, the appearance of white and colored signs on facilities and lynchings. So at the bottom in the red, I show tallies of known lynchings of black Americans from the 1800s into the 1900s. And the part in yellow is the 1890s that we're talking about, a sustained campaign of lynching targeted African-American men, especially. At the same time in the Ottoman Empire, Sultan Abdul Hamid was still in power. He was the emperor and his empire was slowly dwindling. At its height, the Ottoman Empire included Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, Egypt, Hungary, Macedonia, Romania, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and some of Arabia, as well as a considerable amount of the North African coastal strip. Um, it was all under Muslim rule. Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who had started his government, allowing for a constitutional monarchy and then getting rid of it. And then at some point he brings it back, but he was actually trying to be very centralized and authoritarian in his role. And he was trying to unite these disparate groups under one banner, but a lot of them wanted their freedom because the people were not treated the same way. And the upper right, you see the great uncle of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who was the Sultan when Abdul Baha and his family arrived in Akka, and to whom Baha'u'llah had written that famous tablet where he had told him about this puppet show he had seen as a child. The areas that you see in yellow and orange were lost during the time of Abdul Hamid II, the majority of the empire. And so by the time before World War I, the Ottoman Empire is reduced to what you see in pink. So I mentioned that the people were not all treated the same. For example, the Armenian Christians, they were treated like second-class citizens. The Armenians, they were Christian, so they couldn't serve as witnesses in trials. Very often, their lands were looted and there were militant groups that would come into Anatolia, where it was mostly Armenian in eastern Anatolia, and they would attack these people. And the Armenians decided to send a delegation to Congress of Berlin, which had the European powers there gathered, signing this treaty. And what happened was they asked for an article to be dedicated to protecting their rights and to giving them full citizenship, like uh, to be treated as equal citizens in the Ottoman Empire. The European powers tried to pressure the Sultan, but he responded with a feeling of great threat. He felt like the Armenians were a weak people who were hiding behind their European powers and that they were trying to help these powers continue to take away pieces of land if you recall that one of the powers was Russia, and Russia was indeed interested in the lands of the Ottoman Empire, and they were also interested in protecting the Armenians. And they had promised the Armenians that they would give them protection as Russians. And a lot of Armenians later moved to Russia, and they adopted Russian culture. And it, Russia had become strong with respect to Turkey in the Turco-Russian Wars, because Russia had won that war. Long story short, Sultan Abdul Hamid II responds by authorizing the rebels, the Kurdish rebels, and they came to be known as the Hamidiyya troops. And he allowed these people to come into Anatolia and kill Armenians there and throughout the empire. 
there were massacres of Armenians. In these short years after Baha'u'llah's passing in 1892, so in 1894 to 1896, about 100,000 to 300,000 Armenians are killed and about 50,000 children become orphaned. The picture on the right shows an Armenian family or what remains of one seeking help from missionaries as refugees. Some Armenian militants protested. They seized the Ottoman Bank headquarters in Istanbul to bring European attention to the massacres, but they failed to gain any help. These massacres predated the later, what's recently called genocide of Armenians by President Biden in April on the anniversary of the Armenian massacres in 1915. But this gives you an idea of what was happening at the time that ultimately led to the Ottoman Empire trying to cleanse the entire country of these Christians so that they wouldn't have to deal with the Armenian question. So we see that a lot of oppression was happening in the Ottoman Empire as well. So when Baha'u'llah was passing away, before he passed away, he had actually appointed Abdul Baha in his Kitab Aqdas, his Book of Laws, his most holy book. Uh, this is the first time in religious history that's written that we know of that a messenger or someone who claims to be a messenger of God actually states who will follow him, who will be his successor, and writes it down. The two quotes from the right are from the Kitab Aqdas. In the family of Baha'u'llah, references to parts of trees refer to the men and women, for example, the branch, any reference to a branch is like the son of Baha'u'llah and the root being Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha was referred to as the most great branch. He also revealed his last major work, the Epistles to the Son of the Wolf. And in this work, he refers to his will and testament, the Kitab At, as the crimson book. He did not share the contents of his will and testament with anyone, and he kept the document in his own possession until his last illness. He entrusted it in a locked box to Abdul Baha. One other thing that Baha'u'llah did before he passed away, he gave Abdul Baha the mandate to arrange for the burial of the remains of the Bab. If you know the story, the Bab, who was predecessor of Baha'u'llah, who was a prophet in his own right, was executed by firing squad. And his body was riddled with bullets along with the body of his, a companion, a believer, a young man who believed in him. So these remains had traveled for about 60 years from place to place and hidden to be protected from people who meant to harm the faith. And finally, one of the greatest uh, achievements of Abdul Baha was to follow Baha'u'llah's instructions and to build on that spot a beautiful edifice to honor this martyred Bob. This space where you see these trees is where Baha'u'llah identified on his last trip to Haifa, where to bury the Bob. And the mausoleum that was built later, the shrine of the Bob, stands near those trees, and those trees are still there. In September of 1891, Baha'u'llah intimated to Abdul Baha his desire to depart from this world. On 8 May 1892, he fell ill. Shoki Afandi described Baha'u'llah's final illness in these words. He contracted a slight fever, which though it mounted the following day, soon after subsided, he continued to grant interviews to certain of the friends and pilgrims, but it soon became evidence that he was not well. His fever returned in a more acute form than before. His general condition grew steadily worse. Complication happened. Shuba Hanum, Abdul Baha's daughter, related that on this day of sadness, a servant came from Bahji to Haifa. The servant brought a tablet from Baha'u'llah to Abdul Baha. I don't feel well. Please come see me and bring Hanum. The servant brought two 
forces with himself. Khanum was the sister of Abdul Baha, Bahi Khanum, because Baha'u'llah always calling her Khanum. Abdul Baha, with sister Bahi Khanum, left immediately, they went to Bahji. Tuba Khanum related, we children with my mother stay at home and then we were in the Haifa and we didn't go that time and we were sad because each day the news came that our adored Baha'u'llah fever had not abated. After five days, we all went to Bahji. We were very distressed that the illness had become serious. Abdul Baha has himself written an account of those grievous days. It is called the Lohe Hazar Beit or the Tablet of 1000 Verses. Adib Tayrzad summarized one part of this tablet in these words. During the day that Baha'u'llah was very sick, Abdul Baha all the time was with Baha'u'llah, day and night, deep sorrow and depression. One day, when Baha'u'llah was laying down on his sick bed, he told Abdul Baha, he ordered actually Abdul Baha to gather all this paperwork that he had in ho- room uh, to put in two big cases. Abdul Baha was very sad. He hesitated to do that. Uh, Baha'u'llah again ordered an- another time. Abdul Baha with trembling hands, and tearful eyes was beginning to gather the paper when Majdaddin entered the room. Uh, Majdaddin was the son of the faithful uh, brother of uh, Baha'u'llah, Agha Kalim, uh, but he was not like his father. He was the most treacherous among the family. He was the most formidable enemy of Abdul Baha. He was the backbone, and he was like Mirza Muhammad Ali and was a covering prayer. In this tablet, Abdul Baha further described the agony of his heart as he forced himself to gather Baha'u'llah's paper. Seeing Majuddin, Abdul Baha asked for assistance, and Majuddin assists Abdul Baha to, to gather all these papers. After these papers, put in the cases, sealed and put in the cases, Baha'u'llah told Abdul Baha, these two uh, cases belong to you. Implying in the approach of the final hours of Baha'u'llah, uh, Earth uh, love, these uh, words for Abdul Baha was like an arrow in his heart. It was so painful for Abdul Baha. Tuba Khanum account continued. Baha'u'llah asked for us, the ladies and children to go to him. He told us that he had left the will and testament and appointed Abdul Baha a successor and Abdul Baha would arrange everything for the family, the friend and faith. At dawn on May 29, 1892, Baha'u'llah's spirit left its mortal frame. Abdul Baha at once sent a cable to Sultan Hamid, the son of Baha, has said, in that same cable, Abdul Baha asked to bury his father near the mansion of Bahji, and Sultan consent to this plan. Abdul Baha was in a state of intense shock and grief. A few hours after the passing of Baha'u'llah, in the first light of morning, he and his brother Mirza Mehdi tried to prepare the, everything for the burial of uh, Baha'u'llah. Adib Tahirzadeh gives us a detailed account of what then happened. When they were about to wash Baha'u'llah's blessed body, Mirza Muhammad Ali told Abdul Baha, I think it would be better to take these cases out of this room, not become wet. And Abdul Baha's condition was so awful because of sadness, because of the passing his father. He couldn't tolerate anything and he uh, agreed. He didn't know what is the purpose of this, uh, moving these cases. And I agree with that and the cases um, they removed. And that was the last time everybody saw that cases.
On the evening of the same day, Baha'u'llah's sacred body was interred within a small room of a house near the mansion. As soon as the news of Baha'u'llah's passing came to the city, everybody from all around the Akka, they came to give respect to their family. Nine days and, and nights, Abdullah Baha was doing, uh, arranged everything for them, plus was giving money to the poor. Many the, uh, of the guests were sitting under the tree that was around the mansion. About mm-hmm. every day, 500 people was there. It, it was their guest. After Baha take care of this stuff, when his heart was really breaking and was feeling very sad. For three days and night, Abdul Baha couldn't sleep, couldn't have a, a moment rest. Though he wept for hours at a time, he could not find relief. He was also the task of communicating the news of Baha'u'llah passing to Persia and other lands. Haji Mirza Haider Ali that time was in Yaz and when he heard about passing of Baha'u'llah, he said, I was so stunned that I could not even cry. The news of his ascension spread everywhere and now the population of Persia was at that time in the grip of a merciless attack of cholera. The people made merry and rejoiced and ready hold the Baha'is. On the fourth night of the night of Baha'u'llah's ascension, Abdul Baha relates in the tablet of 1000 verses, he rose from his bed he thought if he walk a little bit, maybe he become calm down. And he came out from bed and start to walk. And suddenly through the window, he saw his brothers in the garden with the two cases. Adib Tayyazadeh said Abdul Baha was deeply disturbed by seeing his unfaithful brothers had uh, opened the cases which had been removed from Baha'u'llah's room and were looking through Baha'u'llah's paper, those papers that had been entrusted to Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha was deeply disturbed by the treachery of his brother so soon after the ascension of his father. This act of unfaithfulness committed so dishonorably against the most sacred trust of God inflicted further pain and suffering upon his sorrow laden heart. He returned to his bed immediately after this incident, for he did not wish his brother to know he had seen them interfering the cases. Abdu'l-Baha was highly distressed at his father's passing having recognized his station was when he was eight or nine. And he was crying similarly to how he had cried when Baha'u'llah became a dervish in the Kurdistan mountains. And part of his responsibilities, as Kian was saying, was to host everyone that was coming. And then to see his brothers take his box was just beyond belief. And then, Part of Abdul Baha's responsibilities were to send to Akka the lock box in which the Qatabi Ad, which is the will and testament of Baha'u'llah, had been kept since Baha'u'llah revealed it. The ninth day of, after the ascension of Baha'u'llah, the seal, which Baha'u'llah had himself placed upon the document, was broken. The Qatabi Ad was then read aloud in the presence of nine witnesses chosen from Baha'u'llah's family and companions. And as you see here, we are showing like a case with that lock there that his things would have been in. And on the bottom, we have a picture of the Qatabi Ad, which is available for purchase. The Qatabi Ad opens with these words. Although the realm of glory hath none of the vanities of the world, Yet within the treasury of trust and resignation, we have bequeathed to our heirs an excellent and priceless heritage. Earthly treasures we have not bequeathed, nor have we added such cares as they entail. 
Towards the end of this brief tablet, Baha'u'llah clearly designates his successor in these words. The will of the divine testator is this. It is incumbent upon Agzan, the Afnan, and my kindred to turn one and all their faces towards the most mighty branch. Consider that which we have revealed in our most holy book. When the ocean of my presence hath ebbed and the book of my revelation is ended, turn your faces toward him whom God hath purposed, who hath branched from this ancient root. The object of this sacred verse is none other except the most mighty branch, Abdul Baha. Thus have we graciously revealed unto you our potent will, and I am verily the gracious, the all powerful. You see above, we have a picture of what might look like his writing his last will. And we highlighted this last statement because this last statement seemed to have set off very, very severe covenant breaking. Verily, God has ordained the station of the greater branch, which was Muhammad Ali, to be beneath that of the most great branch, which is Abdul Baha. He is in truth, the ordainer, the all wise. We have chosen the greater after the most great as decreed by him who is the all knowing, the all informed. And so Muhammad Ali was not satisfied with the title Baha'u'llah had given him in his will. Baha'u'llah concludes his will and testament with these words. That which is conducive to the regeneration of the world and the salvation of the people and kindreds of the earth have been set down from the heaven of the utterance of him who is the desire of the world. Give ye a hearing ear to the counsels of the pen of glory. Better is this for you than all that is on the earth. Unto this beareth witness my glorious and wondrous book. On the same day, a large group of the believers gathered in the shrine of Baha'u'llah to hear his will. It was read this time by Majuddin, who was called the archbreaker. If you remember the prior slides, the archbreaker of the covenant. Abdul Baha then met with the women and servants of the household, and Majuddin again read the tablet aloud to those assembled. Suba Hanum relates that. Mad Ilya, the mother of Muhammad Ali, expressed pleasure at that time at the appointment of Abdul Baha as the center of the covenant. Abdul Baha arranged for copies of the Kitabiyah to be sent to the friends in Persia. Haji Mirza Haydar Ali relates that the copy sent to Yazd arrived there just one week after the news of the passing of Baha'u'llah. Emphatically and explicitly, Baha'u'llah had appointed the beloved master as the sole interpreter of his word. When the friends received this great news, they were calm, and with hearts full of hope, they arose to raise the banner of servitude and uphold it with their utmost strength. In family studies, births, marriages, and deaths, are some of the hardest times that families have. And as you can see, this is what's happening. So soon after the Katabi Ad was shared with the friends, one of the believers asked Abdul Baha if he would seal a tablet written by Baha'u'llah for his brother with one of Baha'u'llah's own seals. And you see to the left, these are actual deals that were used by Baha'u'llah. And these seals were Abdul Baha had placed in one of the two large cases which Baha'u'llah had instructed him to pack in the last days of his life. Abdul Baha said to his two half brothers to give him the seals. And they lied and said they, they did not know what he was asking for, as they knew nothing at all about any cases which he had visually seen them take. Abdul Baha later related that his whole being began to tremble when he heard such a response, for it meant that terrible tests and trials lay ahead. Now, in this picture, people that are circled, Majuddin is on the left and Muhammad Ali is on the right. 
And Mahajuddin is the art breaker and he highly influenced Muhammad Ali. Above them, you see Abdullah and to the left of him, Mirza Mehdi. Jim and I actually looked. We couldn't find pictures of Mahajuddin when he was older. We did find one of Muhammad Ali, but as these were sincere and terrible covenant breakers, we were not going to show you the picture we found. We don't want to put more energy into them than they deserve. Once the Kitabi Ad had been read and heard by all, Abdul Baha wrote a tablet to the believers in Persia and other lands. And we found a picture of a quill and paper and a seal and the picture of what a seal would look like on Abdul Baha's tablets. And it says, he is the all glorious, the world's great light, once resplendent upon all mankind has set to shine everlastingly from the Abha horizon, his kingdom of fadeless glory, shedding splendor upon his loved ones from on high and breathing into their hearts and souls the breath of eternal life. O ye beloved of the Lord, beware, beware, lest ye hesitate and waver. Let not fear fall upon you, neither be troubled nor dismayed. Take ye good heed, lest this calamitous day slacken the flames of your ardor and quench your tender hopes. Today is the day for steadfastness and constancy. Blessed are they that stand firm and immovable as the rock and brave the storm and stress of this tempestuous hour. They verily shall be the recipients of God's grace and shall receive his divine assistance and shall truly be victorious. He was writing this letter as a plea for unity among the believers. Abdul Baha ended the tablet with the following. The sun of truth, that most great light, has set upon the horizon of the world to rise with deathless splendor over the realm of the limitless. In his most holy book, he called the firm and steadfast of his friends. O peoples of the world, should the radiance of my beauty be veiled and the temple of my body be hidden, feel not perturbed. Nay, arise and bestir yourselves, that my cause may triumph, and my word be heard by all mankind. The servant of Baha, the mystery of God, the most great branch, Abdul Baha, the stainless mirror of his love. of his word the perfect exemplar Abdul Baha Abdul Baha Abdul Baha The limb of the love of God
the servants of Baha'u'llah, the mystery of God, the most great branch. This first tablet of Abdul Baha that Rose shared was read with joy by the believers in Persia and other lands in the Near East, in India, and in Egypt. It inspired the steadfast followers of Baha'u'llah to arise to teach with great new enthusiasm. Haji Mirza Haydar Ali, a devoted believer of Baha'u'llah, was traveling through Persia at that time. He later wrote of those early days of Abdul Baha's ministry. He said the ministry of Abdul Baha began so vigorously that Baha'i communities everywhere were overwhelmed. Letters from the master poured into every village, town, and country, like the drops of the rain of spring. The friends were cheered and enamored by his life-giving words. Whoever received a tablet would make many copies and send them as precious gifts to friends throughout the length and breadth of the East. This opened a new field of activity, that of regular and informative correspondence amongst all the believers. One of the people who have received a tablet in their family from Abdul Baha shared with me that he would write the names of not just their family, but or the person that he was writing to. He would also write the names of many other people in that village or in nearby towns and ask after their health in the tablet. He would address multiple people in the same letter. And then those letters would be copied by hand and shared with the people who were addressed as well. It wasn't only to Persia that Abdul Baha was writing. He was writing to Egypt, Iraq, India, and Burma, basically anywhere the faith had spread. He would send his guidance. But at the same time, Mirza Muhammad Ali, prompted by the ambition of his cousin, Majuddin, was already working to oppose Abdul Baha's appointment as the center of the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Mirza Muhammad Ali began his campaign quietly at first. He won over those of Baha'u'llah's family who were still living in the mansion of Bahji. He started poisoning their hearts and minds against Abdul Baha. Then he began to spread his intrigues to the other believers who were a resident in the Holy Land. Abdul Baha knew very well what was happening. He forbade anyone in the other lands to open, any of the friends to open any envelope that didn't have his own seal on it. That's why the seals are so important because you're guaranteed that you're opening the right letter or the letter from the person who is on the envelope. And he privately counseled his half brothers and others of his relatives against actions which would damage the cause of their father. But as Haji Mirza Haidar Ali recounts, all these counsels fell on deaf ears. In that first summer of his ministry, Abdu'l-Bal was so grieved by the actions of his half-brothers that he spent an entire month in seclusion on Mount Carmel. He rented a small apartment in a stone building near the lower cave of Elijah, and there spent many hours in prayer and supplication. Abdu'l-Bal endured this silently for many, many years. He later recounted the treachery his brothers perpetrated on the passing of Baha'u'llah and how that affected him. The center of violation purloined in its entirety the divine trust which specifically appertained to this servant. He took everything and returned nothing. To this day, the usurper unjustly remains in possession. Although each single item is more precious for Abdu'l-Bahá than the dominion of earth and heaven, till now I have kept silent and have not breathed a word, lest it bring us into disrepute amongst strangers. This was a severe blow to me. I suffered, I sorrowed, I wept, but I spoke not. So even while Abdul Baha tried to hold in check the dissension within the family of Baha'u'llah, he continued to supply those of his relatives living at Bahji with all they demanded. So if you look here, the um, family of Baha'u'llah, they stayed in the mansion after Baha'u'llah's passing. Abdul Baha did not. He stayed in the city of Akka with his immediate family. 
they also had built these other structures around this mansion. So this uh, part of the family was living there and they kept asking him for things, deliberately trying to impoverish Abdul Baha. So Abdul Baha's family lived a life of austerity in Akka, a very simple life. In contrast, the rest of this family was living in luxury in Bahji. On his return from the month spent on Mount Carmel, Abdu Baha moved into his mother's room in the house of Abud, that's in Akka. The room next to it, which Baha'u'llah had occupied, was kept as it had been during Baha'u'llah's lifetime. Abdu Baha's wife, his unmarried sister, Bahia Khanum, and four daughters longed to be able to help him bear the burdens which his appointment as the center of Baha'u'llah's covenant laid upon him. But as Tuba Khanum relates, one of his daughters, the ladies of the family were helpless, as according to the Muslim law, they were unable to speak to any man, even on business affairs, so that it was only within the house that they were able to do anything at all to lighten the burden of our beloved master. There was indeed no one who could lighten Abdul Baha's burden. However, Baha'u'llah had conferred upon him special powers, which enabled him to carry that heavy burden and to fulfill the responsibilities Baha'u'llah had given him. As Adib Tahir Zadeh explained, unlike a human being whose mind can only deal with one subject at a time, Abdul Baha, who had all the powers of Baha'u'llah conferred upon him, was free from this limitation. Usually a person becomes overwhelmed when afflicted by sufferings or faced with insurmountable obstacles. Under such circumstances, even men of outstanding ability show their weaknesses and reveal their human fealty. They try to cope with one problem at a time, and they often seek the help of experts and advisors to help them make a decision. Not so with Abdul Baha, he said. In the first place, he acted independently, for no individual was qualified to advise or assist him in his manifold activities. His soul was not bound by the limitations of the world of humanity, and his mind was not overwhelmed when faced with a host of problems simultaneously. In the midst of calamities, when the ablest of men would have succumbed to pressure, he remained detached while directing his attention to whatever he desired. Meanwhile, Back in America, the first Baha'i teacher arrives, 1892, the same year as the ascension of Baha'u'llah, Anton Haddad arrives in New York, the first Baha'i in America. And later that year, Ibrahim Kairola joined him. They were like business partners, so they weren't arriving here to teach the faith. They were on some kind of a, a business project. One year later, 1893, at the first parliament of the world's religions, the name of Baha'u'llah was first mentioned in America publicly. One year later, 1894, Ibrahim Kairola has moved to Chicago and is starting to teach the faith to people he's met. In his first class that had four people in it, one of them was the insurance salesman Thornton Chase, who declared his belief and Baha'u'llah that year, 1894, becoming the first new Baha'i in uh, America. By 1896, Kairola was giving regular lessons, a series of lessons, and a year later, there were about 60 believers in the Chicago area. This is over a period of five years. These new Baha'is wrote to Abdu'l Baha when they declared but all the correspondence went through Kairola because there was no one in Akka who could translate from English into Arabic and Persian. In 1896, as the numbers of seekers attending Harula's classes in the Chicago area began to increase rapidly, in the Holy Land, the unfaithful members of Baha'u'llah's family brought into the open their opposition to the center of the covenant. For four distressful years, Abdul Baha had done everything in his power to guide and enlighten his misguided relatives. The believers in the Holy Land were aware of the grievances nursed by Mirza Muhammad Ali, but the believers in Persia and the other lands where the faith was established were unaware of his disloyalty. 
Adib Taizadeh relates that after four years of strengthening their position, Mirza Muhammad Ali and his party felt that it was time to unmask themselves. They did this by printing letters loaded with falsehoods, misleading statements, and calamities against the center of the covenant, posing themselves as the voice of truth, trying to purify the cause which they themselves claimed to have been polluted by those who were faithful to Abdul Baha. In his propaganda, Mirza Muhammad Ali did not contest the authenticity of the Kitabi art. Rather, he expressed his grievance that he had been barred from partnership with Abdul Baha in discerning the affairs of the cause. He wanted to share with him the station of the center of the covenant. Dr. Yunus Haniafukan, a secretary to Abdul Baha, remembered Abdul Baha's words to his half brother, Mirza Diaullah when he learned that these letters had just been disparged. I swear by the righteousness of God, a day shall come when Mirza Muhammad Ali would wish that his fingers had been cut off so that he could not have taken the pen to announce his breaking of the covenant. For four years, I have concealed this matter so that the beloved of God might not learn of your unfaithfulness to the covenant. It is now beyond my power to conceal it any longer. You have announced yourselves to the believers. In several tablets revealed during these years, Abdul Baha makes it very clear that though appointed by Baha'u'llah as the center of his covenant, and the sole interpreter of his words, his station was above all else, the station of servitude. This is my firm, my unmistakable conviction, the essence of my unconcealed and explicit belief, a conviction and belief which the denizens of the Abba kingdom fully share. The blessed beauty is the son of truth and his light, the light of truth. The Bab is likewise the son of truth and his light, the light of truth. My station is the station of servitude, a servitude which is complete, pure and real, firmly established, enduring, obvious, explicitly revealed and subject to no interpretation, whatever. I am the interpreter of the word of God. Such is my interpretation. The master and his family were at this time still living in the house of Abud. The house was too small to accommodate the family. Now that his daughters were grown and married, in October of 1896, Abdu'l-Baha rented the main building of the former governor of Abdu'l-Baha Pasha. This house is situated in the Mujadila quarter in the northwest corner of Akka. It now became the master's home and a home also for his daughters, their husbands, and their families. It was in this house in March of 1897 that Abdul Baha's eldest grandchild, Shogi Fendi, was born. In 1897, Mirza Akajan, the former amnesis of Baha'u'llah and the first to recognize the station of Baha'u'llah in the years before he declared his mission, lead himself with the covenant breakers. Mirza Akajan had served Baha'u'llah for nearly 40 years as his secretary, as his servant, and as his close companion. But near the end of his life, Baha'u'llah dismissed Mirza Akajan from his service. 
Mirza Akajan had become proud that he was so close to Baha'u'llah and had begun to act in ways that caused Baha'u'llah extreme displeasure. Mirza Akajan had a weakness for material possession and had begged Baha'u'llah to give him a number of the precious gifts sent to him by the believers. In addition, he had, with the help of Abdul Baha's half brothers, acquired a number of properties in the Akka area. Soon after Baha'u'llah's passing, these same half brothers plotted to kill Mirza Akajan in order to obtain these gifts and properties themselves. Mirza Akajan fled to Abdul Baha's presence, where he begged forgiveness for his past conduct and implored um, shelter in Abdul Baha's house. Abdul Baha granted both requests, but soon the covenant breakers regretted their former persecution of Mirza Akajan. They now planned to persuade him to join them at Baji so they could make use of him for their own purposes. They wrote a letter which purported to be addressed to Mirza Akajan from the Baha'is of Persia, encouraging him to take a leadership role in the community and suggesting that he speak out amongst the believers who would be gathered at Baji for the fifth anniversary of the passing of Baha'u'llah. Once the covenant breakers had come out into the open, they expanded the scope of their activities by attempting to blacken Abdul Baha's reputation amongst local government officials, accusing him of exalting his own station and of being a forerunner of discord and strife. On this occasion of the fifth anniversary of Baha'u'llah's passing, they arranged for a high-ranking government official to be present at Baji. They even invited him to remain out of sight, but to keep a close watch on what was happening. And their hope was that Mirza Akajan's actions would incite violence amongst the believers and provide a pretext for a report to be sent to Constantinople, which would lead to the arrest and detention of Abdul Baha himself. These plans went sadly awry. Mirza Akajan did attempt to speak out, and an uproar began. But as soon as Abdul Baha arrived on the scene, Mirza Kajan fled, shouting abuse into the shrine of Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha's dignified presence calmed all those present. But after this episode, Mirza Kajan openly declared his support for the covenant breakers. Once the covenant breakers became openly hostile to Abdul Baha, they would no longer allow him the use of a room on the ground floor of the mansion of Baji, where he rested along with other believers who had walked from Akka before entering the shrine. Abdul Baha then began to use another small house near the shrine for this purpose, and this is today the pilgrim house of Baji. Shortly after Mirza Akajan joined Mirza Muhammad Ali and his followers, Mirza Muhammad Ali and his brothers bribed the chief of police in Akka and had an official indictment against Abdul Baha drawn up. They even took their case to a court in Akka with a list of preposterous accusations the first of which was that Baha'u'llah was not a prophet of God, but only a holy man who spent a life of seclusion in prayer and meditation. Abdul Baha, on the other hand, they claimed had exalted the station of Baha'u'llah for political reasons. Abdul Baha appeared in the court and there read aloud the Kitabiyat, Baha'u'llah's will and testament, in which Abdul Baha is unequivocally appointed as the center of the covenant. And he explained clearly that the covenant breakers had, through their own actions, 
severed themselves entirely from the Baha'i community. He refuted the other charges brought against him with equal forcefulness, and the case was dismissed. Though the covenant breakers failed in this attempt, they continued to do all that they could to damage the reputation of Abdul Baha and to humiliate him and to cause him intense pain. A year or two later, the covenant breakers allowed Mirza Akajan to take up residence in the very building where Bahá'u'lláh was buried. When this happened, Abdul Baha forbade any of the believers to enter the shrine, and he did not enter it himself. His station continued until Mirza Akajan's passing in 1901. Over the years since the passing of Baha'u'llah, they had built up a considerable network of corresponders, but throughout this severe crisis, the believers in Persia, with the exception of very few individuals who had leagued themselves with Mirza Muhammad Ali, remained completely loyal to Abdul Baha. In 1896 in Iran, Nasruddin Shah was struck down by an assassin. The Baha'is had nothing whatever to do with this deed, but memories of the assassination attempt made by three deranged Babis in 1852 were still powerful. The immediate reaction of the populace was to blame those they still called Babis. It was as a direct consequence of this assassination that the famed Baha'i poet Varga and his 12-year-old son Rahula, already held in prison in Tehran, were brutally put to death. Atrocities were committed against the Baha'is in several other localities. It was during these years that Abdu'l Baha counseled the believers against joining any political parties or factions. While the ever-moving pen of Abdu'l Baha counseled cheered and inspired the believers, he had also to plan for the safe removal of the bodily remains of the Bab from Persia to the Holy Land and for their entombment on the slopes of Mount Carmel. Abdu'l Baha had already taken steps to purchase the ground which Baha'u'llah had designated as the spot on which the shrine of the Bab was to be built. It would have been a simple transaction had it not been for the covenant breakers. We won't tell that story, but uh, Abdul Baha did prevail. This large crate on the left of the picture holds the marble sarcophagus provided by the Baha'is of Burma for holding the remains of the Bab and Anis. It had to be transported and made available at the right time. So this is before 1909, somewhere in Haifa. I'm going to tell you the story of the first Western pilgrims to meet Abdu'l-Baha. In 1897, Anton Haddad traveled from the United States to the Middle East. Ibrahim Kairula urged him to visit Akko and meet with Abdu'l-Baha before returning to the States. He did so, and shortly after he returned to New York, he wrote those words to Kairula. Oh, dear brother. Heaven is there and the paradise of God. Everybody would desire to be a servant in this place. The appearance of glory and those attributes, the signs of kindness and generosity, love and happiness for the human race. On account of this, he, Abdul Baha cannot sleep nights, people not leaving him a minute. Everybody goes to him for help. He never rejects them. His time is spent enlightening all, rich as well as poor. It makes no difference to him. His knowledge, understanding, and high attributes are his characteristics. 
Anton Hadid description of Abdul Baha fired the early believers with enthusiasm to visit him themselves. Among the newly formed Baha'is communities in California were a number of wealthy individuals. The most well-known of them, Miss P.B. Hearst, widow of the late Senator George Hearst. Miss Hearst was widely renowned for her philanthropic activities. She had already planned a visit to Egypt in the autumn of 1898, and now decided to visit Akko also. She invited Edward and Lua Gatzinger, through whom she had heard of the Baha'i teaching, to accompany her. She sent another invitation to Ibrahim Khairullah and his wife. He promptly accepted. Hairula was writing a book on what he knew about the Baha'i teaching and was eager to gain Abdul Baha's approval for his project. Phoebe has included in the party a number of her own relatives and employees who had become believers, including her butler, Robert Turner, the first black American to accept the new teaching. Next. In this picture, you can see some of the first pilgrimage. So we can see on the top left, Robert Turner, and then Anna Epperson, Julia Pearson. And at the bottom, you can see the daughter of Ibrahim Khairula from his first marriage, uh, Miss Morrison Khairula, his second wife, Dr. Ibrahim Khairula and Laura Katzinger, one of the 19 disciples of uh, Abdul Baha, and the second daughter of Ibrahim Khairullah. Next. The entire party sailed from New York to Sherbrooke in late September and proceeded to Paris. Khairullah then went on ahead to Egypt. Miss Harris had an apartment in Paris and in it were staying two of her nieces and a young woman named Mary Ellis Bolles. Within a short time, Mary Ellis Bolles and Miss Hellest nieces accepted the Baha'i teaching and joined the pilgrimage party. After spending three weeks in Egypt, Khairula reached Akko on November 11, 1898. Abdul Baha commemorated his arrival by ending the six and a half years of mourning for Baha'u'llah, and for the very first time, opened the room directly above Baha'u'llah's tomb to the pilgrims. He also bestowed on Khairullah the unique privilege of assisting him in breaking ground on the spot on Mount Carmel where he had been instructed by Baha'u'llah to lay uh, rest the mortal remains of the Bab. Khairullah had carried to Akko a number of letters from the American believers. To those, Abdul Baha replied. Though his reply would not arrive in the United States until February of 1899, direct correspondence between him and the American believers had now begun. The other pilgrims from the West had to wait in Egypt until hearing from Abdul Baha that they could proceed to Akko. Because of the suspicions which Mirza Muhammad Ali and his accomplices had aroused in the official circles, the entire party of nine could not travel to Akko together. Edward and Lua Katzinger were invited to Akko first and they arrived on December 10, the first North American believers to attend the presence of Abdul Baha. In Akko, there were only one believer beside Ibrahim Khairullah who spoke English. Thus, communication in words was difficult, but Laura Gatzinger soon wrote, the atmosphere of the place is wondrous. Knowledge and understanding seems to float in the air. 
I feel that there are no words in which to describe the place. One must see for himself to know. Not that the house is so grand or its surrounding, not at all. For everything, even their manners, the dress is simplicity itself. But there is a dignity and grandeur in this simplicity that is quite beyond descriptions. The face of the master is gloriously beautiful. His eyes read one's very soul. Still, they are full of divine love and can melt one's heart. Um, the pilgrimage were able to stay only a few days, but as Miss Hurst wrote later, I assure you those three days were the most memorable days of my life. Still, I feel incapable of describing them in the slightest degree. The master, I will not attempt to describe. I will only state that I believe with all my heart that he is the master. And my greatest blessing in this world is that I have been privileged to be in his presence. Though he does not seek to impress one at all, strength, power, purity, love, and holiness are radiant from his majestic Yet his humble personality and the spiritual atmosphere which surround him and most powerfully affects all those who are blessed by being near him is indescribable. On the last day of the pilgrimage, Abdul Baha arranged for his guest to visit the garden of Ridwan, which Baha'u'llah had often visited and then met them at Baji. May Boles relates, when we reached the outer door, Abdul Baha removed his shoes and motioned us to do likewise. We followed him through passageways and then arrived to the holy tomb. As we gazed upon the veiled door, our souls stirred within us and though seeking release. The blessed master was calm and radiant, and he led us to the open space at the end of the court beside the tomb. We all stood in silence until he bade one of our group to sing the holy city. No pen could describe the solemn beauty of that moment. And in a broken voice, this young girl sang the praises of the glory of God, while all were immersed in the ocean of the divine presence. Last night I lay asleep, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels in heaven and The next morning, the pilgrimage left for Haifa, where they were to board their ship. Abdul Baha called them to his present early in the morning. May related that. He asked them, for his sakes, not to weep, nor would he talk to us or teach us until all the tears were banished 
and we were quite calm. Then he said, pray that your hearts may be cut from yourself and from the world, that you may be confirmed by the Holy Spirit and filled with the fire of the love of God. Nothing shall be impossible to you if you have faith. And now I give you a commandment which shall be for a covenant between you and me, that ye have faith, that your faith be stood fast as a rock that no storm can move, that nothing can disturb, and that it endure through all things even to the end. As ye have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. This is the balance. This is the balance. This is the balance. Toward the end of Baha'u'llah's earthly life, he told Abdu'l Baha that he would raise up souls who would hasten to the service of the covenant and would assist Abdu'l Baha in spreading his faith. Ali Huli Khan, 1899. He was a family of royalty. His father became a Babi in 1847 and then became the mayor of Tehran. And his brother was also the mayor of Tehran. Ali Kuli Khan became a Baha'i in 1896 at age 15. He was highly educated. He was fluent in English. And he appeared in the Holy Land in Abdu'l Baha's presence in 1899. Abdu'l Baha immediately put him to work as his secretary. And he served Abdu'l Baha in the Holy Land as his secretary until 1901, at which time Abdu'l Baha sent him to America with Mirza Abu Fazl as his translator. And he had a very distinguished life and career, and his daughter, Marzi Gale, both as early translators of the writings in English. 1900, Sarah Farmer. She had a distinguished family in a city in Maine called Elliot. Her father was an inventor, and the household was constantly visited by distinguished thinkers and scientists. She had an inquiring mind, and when she inherited the house, she opened it as a retreat center. In 1900, she visited Abdu Baha, and she declared her faith, and that was the founding of uh, Greenacre the Baha'i School in Maine. 1900, Laura Clifford Barney. She was from a wealthy Washington, D.C. family. And she was in school in Paris in association with Mabel's, that same group. And so she was taught the faith through them. Of course, we know of her as the one who compiles some answered questions. She also used her wealth to fund things that might not have happened without her money. This is just a few in those two years. Other places in the world, 1899, the Baha'is of 
Ishkabad. Where's that? Well, in Turkmenistan, it's the country just north of Iran. Many of the persecuted Babis had fled across the border into Turkmenistan. So there was a strong community there, and they petitioned Abdul Baha for permission to build the first Baha'i House of Worship in their city, in their country, and received that permission in 1899. 1899, the Baha'is of Tehran were instructed by Abdu Baha to elect their first, the first local spiritual assembly ever. So that shows the development of that community. And Abdu Baha begins construction of the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel. Those are all shown in green, in red, on his return from pilgrimage, the first pilgrimage of the Western. Baha'is, Ibrahim K. Rula wants to be designated by Abdu'l Baha as in charge of America, but that's not to be. There's only one center of the covenant, and that's Abdu'l Baha. By 1900, K. Rula stopped communicating with Abdu'l Baha, and he becomes a covenant breaker. This next portion talks about the events that led to Abdu'l Baha's becoming a prisoner once again in the city of Akka. He was not put back into the prison itself, but he was basically under city arrest and was not able to leave the city after these events. In 1901, Mirza Muhammad Ali actually mortgaged Baji in order to obtain fresh funds, and then he sent Mirza Majuddin to Damascus with a petition of the governor of Syria, Nazim Pasha. The petition stated that al Baha was building a fortress on Mount Carmel, which actually was just the basis of the shrine of the Bab, that he was planning a rebellion against the Ottoman rule, and he was receiving military advisors from the West. I guess those were the people on pilgrimage. Mirza Majuddin obtained an interview with the governor and with another high-ranking official. To both, he presented expensive gifts. They tried bribery. He returned to Akka, certain that he was successful in his mission, but the scheme quickly backfired, and you'll see in a moment how that happens. On August 20 of 1901, Al-Tamah gathered with the believers at Baji to celebrate the anniversary of the Declaration of the Bab according to the lunar calendar. On his return to Akka, he learned that both his brothers, Mirza Muhammad Ali and Mirza Badiullah, had been fetched from Baji under armed escort, and that Mirza Mujdin had been brought from his home in Tiberias in the same humiliating manner. al Baha went to the governor's office immediately, and there he learned that Sultan Abdul Hamid had issued a decree ordering that both he and his brothers were to be confined within the walls of Akka, and that the same restrictions which had been imposed on Baha'u'llah and his followers when they first had come to Akka were to be reintroduced. The governor was an admirer of al Baha and was loath to enforce this decree. He had, in fact, delayed its implementation, but now, because of all those earlier machinations in Damascus, he had no choice. Al Baha was detained at the government headquarters for several days and was subjected to long sessions of questioning. He asked that his brothers and the local believers be allowed freedom of movement and assured the authorities that he himself would remain in Acha. And this is just an incredible example of the nature of Al Baha, that he would petition on behalf of these who had done so much harm to him. His greatest single sorrow was that he could no longer visit Baji to pray at the shrine of Allah. So he arranged for a simple wooden cabin to be built on the roof of his house from which he could look towards Baji, and there he prayed. There's a low hill overlooking Baji where at the time red flowers grew in abundance. When the believers returned to Akka from their visits to the shrine, he would ask wistfully, were red, red flowers blooming on the Bakht Atu Ohamara? As we've already mentioned, Yunus Khan Afute, who al Baha named Janabi Khan, was a secretary and interpreter during this period from 1901 to 1908. And in his diary, which is a document that has been published, he talks about that time. Here is an excerpt from that diary. 
Abdu'l-Haq began in those days to disclose certain facts about the plans and strategies of his enemies, so bringing deep concern to the hearts of the friends. While he painted a rather dark picture of the future, no one had any real conception of the gravity of the emerging crisis, whose flames were to engulf first the covenant breakers and then Abdu'l-Bahá himself. I constantly prayed and implored Almighty God to bring to realization only the first part of Abdu'l-Bahá's prophecy. In other words, I prayed that the covenant breakers might fall into the fire of their own sedition and treachery and be consumed by the flames of their own machinations and intrigues. But that the second part of the prediction, after them, me, might not be fulfilled. But alas, his prophecy was realized to its full extent without the least mitigation of the circumstances. That Joseph of the heavenly Egypt, Abdu Waha, was incarcerated for eight years until at last the most great prison was dismantled and that blessed being was able to travel first to Egypt and then Europe and America and raise the call of the kingdom in many gatherings and churches. And we, in praise and gratitude, repeated what Nahim has written. Glad tidings to Jacob, for his beloved son is made sovereign in the Egypt of love. I just love that phrase. The agents of the government showed up at the mansion of Baji and took the covenant breakers into Akka. This news created a variety of impressions in the minds of the friends. The government had op openly shown their dissatisfaction with the general conduct of the covenant breakers. The master had intervened on their behalf and had explained to the authorities that they were his brothers and asked for leniency. On another occasion, I heard that Abdu'l-Bahá had once said, if I will it, I can tie the mustaches and beards of the covenant breakers together and have them exiled to the remotest place on earth. I think that's a little example of Abdu'l-Bahá's sense of humor. In any event, all sorts of thoughts had crossed our minds as to the nature of what was taking place, except no one imagined that this could turn out to be the resumption of Abdu'l-Bahá's incarceration in the prison city. So Abdu'l-Bahá called these two individuals to his presence. After about four or five minutes of ominous silence, Abdu'l-Bahá addressed me in these words. And he's talking about the fact that he's being sent back to Akka. And he's saying that what has happened has brought peace and tranquility, that's the picture at the bottom, to my mind, and will bring victory to the faith of God. But because of the love of the friends of God have for me, this will be somewhat difficult for them to bear. But the focus of the friends should be on the faith of God and not me. Whatever has happened is for the best. If you promise not to become unhappy, I will tell you what has happened. My heart was filled with such trepidation, I could hardly collect my thoughts. And he said, it is nothing serious. Believe that whatever has taken place is for the good of the faith and for the comfort of my heart. The friends must be happy in my happiness and should concentrate their thoughts on the faith itself. He's being put under house arrest, and this is how he's conveying it. And then he says, what has happened to me is a cause for rejoicing, but a cause of grief for the unfortunate covenant breakers. And al continues, I worked for 40 years to turn this prison into a paradise. These individuals have worked for years and have now turned the paradise into a prison and turned ease into hardship. For me, nothing untoward has happened. Wherever I am, I have to take on all the burdens and challenges and strive for the triumph of the cause of God. But it is going to be difficult for those gentlemen who were enjoying a life of comfort and ease in the mansion. Today I heard that the government had sent officials to the mansion that they had taken the gentleman into town in a state of utter misery. And this just blows my mind. So he goes and appeals on their behalf. I went to the chief officer to inquire and notice his embarrassment in attempting to explain the situation. I realized what had happened. He then put in my hands Sultan Abdul Hamid's directive to resume the state of imprisonment in Akka. 
This order had reached him some time ago, but he had not brought it to my attention, and in my absence had summoned these gentlemen to inform them. I have mentioned before that soon these gentlemen, and go to the next slide, that's a picture of Baji where they were living in. He started again, as he kind of paused there, and he said, I've done my work. Only the completion of the Shrine of the Bob remains, and there's a picture of it in its early form. And you can see how they might think it's a fortress. And that, too, will be completed one way or another. This is comforting for me, but those who enjoy their freedom in the mansion, imprisonment will not be easy. They strove for many years and spent a considerable amount of money to bring about my expulsion and exile so they could find peace and comfort in my absence. And this is the result of all my work. He then asks them to go to Haifa to convey the news. You to go to Haifa straight away, bring all the friends together in the pilgrim house and explain the situation in exactly the way I have described it. But while you relate it, beware, beware, lest you bring sadness to any heart. This is a snippet from the song about the Queen of Carmel to talk about the success that Abdu'l-Ha ultimately had in establishing the Shrine of the Ba. There is much wisdom in this imprisonment, Abdu'l-Ha says. It influences the contingent world and reinforces the power of the covenant. Then he emphasized, beware, beware, lest you speak in terms that would bring sadness to any heart. May God go with you. A few snippets on some of the daily activities as recounted by Myron Phelps, who was a New York lawyer, and the Countess M.A. de Cannavaro. They spent the month of December as guests of Abdu Baha. These are some glimpses into the life of the master at that time. It was Ramadan, the Muslim month of fasting. Abdu Baha kept the fast himself and provided a supper every other night for the poorer Muslims of the area. Every week, without fail, he gave alms to the poor. He's a prisoner, and he's doing these things. Phelps described the ragged crowd that gathered outside the master's house every Friday. Many of these men were blind. Many more were pale, emaciated, or aged. Some are on crutches. Some are so feeble that they can barely walk. Most of the women are closely veiled, but enough are uncovered to cause us well to believe that if the veils were lifted, more pain and misery would be seen. Some of them carry babes with pinched and sallow faces. There are perhaps a hundred in this gathering, and besides many children, they are of all races. One meets in these streets. Phelps describes how Baha'u'llah passed through the crowd. He greets them kindly, and when the crowd gets a little too insistent, he gently asks them to step back. And then into each open palm, he places small coins. He seems to know them all. He caresses them with his hand on the face, on the shoulders. He stops a woman with a babe and fondly strokes the child. As they pass, some kiss his hand. To all he says, Marhaba, Marhaba, well done, well done. The Countess de Cannavaro spent much of her time 
talking with Vahir Hanum and then related what she heard to Myron Phelps. Because still under the Muslim customs, women talking to men was not really encouraged. Bahia Kanum spoke of the happiness and harmony that characterized the master's marriage. She explained that her sister-in-law had recently felt it necessary to visit Beirut with two of her daughters on account of their health, and that this was the first time in the marriage that Muniri Kanum had been away from al Baha for any length of time. Since a short time after her departure, the first question put by al Baha to his daughter Ruha every morning had been, Ruha, when do you think your mother will be back? This is a, a side of Abduha, more of a human side, if, if you will. I, that's how I a, am reading this. We wanted to close with this song that seems to talk about some of those qualities. Abduha is our exemplar. He's an exemplar of how it is to react in what we would view as the perfect human way. And I think this song conveys some of that. So. He was diamonds, he was oceans He was eyes of Persian blue He was first light, he was many He was one Open-hearted in the autumn Open-hearted in the spring Summer roses In his tunic Each season He was harbor He was haven He was heaven He was home He was warm smile He was soft voice he was tears Strong and tender Like a river And his heart beat like a bird's How I long to Hear those wings beat Close again new snow on old branches he was crystal in the streams he was silver spinning rainfall he was fire he was water from the deep well he was rainbow on the marsh he was safe path to the hillside He was stars He, he was, was shelter from the cold wind He was warmth against the ice He was lips that told a language of their own His arms held out like branches And his eyes were like a dove's How I long to feel those wings be close again He was diamonds, he was oceans He was colors in the sky was everything and more than I can tell As I stumble through this world I wonder to myself Where is there one who walked this world so
those who did not recognize the voice that was Grant and didn't know her. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to all our presenters. Attendees are now invited to share stories and quotes. They can be from other years and other authors, but should help us better understand Abdul Baha. This is an opportunity to practice telling a story from memory. In the last video where they showed all those wonderful pictures of Abdul Baha, there was the picture of Abdul Baha putting his arm around the little girl with the ringlet curls. That Ruhia McComb, but she was named Rebecca Jones. And when I was growing up on Long Island, she lived on Long Island and she was our high school teacher. And she used to tell us all these wonderful stories about Abdul Baha. And her son put together this amazing montage of her time, the family's time with Abdul Baha, and they would show it from time to time. But one of the stories she told us was the story of how she got her name. Abdul Baha was giving names to the people who had traveled with him, right? And he was changing their name. And she kept thinking, I wish he would do that for me. I really want a different name. But she never said that to him at all. And one day she was out and about and he turns to her all of a sudden, puts his hands on her shoulder, looks at her and says, Ruhia, 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 and walks away. So she got her name. <laughs> House of Justice released a book called The Century of Light in the year 2000. And in that book, they make the remarkable statement. Now think about the 20th century and all of the incredible events that took place. Two world wars, the Cold War, the development of the European Union and all kinds of things like that. But they said that the greatest event of the 20th century was the ministry of Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha. Yeah. And I think we get a sense for that as we go through these stories. I mean, his life, he, he reached out to so many people. So before Baha'u'llah's passing, and this is quotes that were in Mary Perkins book, she says that he said that every communication that he made on behalf of the faith was done with Baha'u'llah's permission. He was not an independent agent. Right. He was agent of Baha'u'llah. One of the things that I remember um, Ruhi telling us is how Abdul Baha did not like to have his picture taken. On this uh, website called uh, Utterance Project, yeah. Yeah. There, there is a slide on there that claims, and, and I haven't found any contradiction, that there are no zero photos of Abdu'l-Bahá between 1868 and 1911. 43 years, no photographs at all, because of what you say, I, I guess. He didn't uh, want his no. picture taken. So when he came to the West or to Europe, they took his picture and he allowed it for the sake of the friends. Right, right. But last night we were looking for some pictures of oh, yeah. uh, some of the family or whatever. And it was like, well, if there weren't pictures of Abduha, maybe there aren't pictures of any of the family. Oh, so right. Not yeah. One picture of the picture of Abdu'l-Bahá sitting in the chair as a young man is a passport picture yeah. from Adrianople. That's why they're all in that chair. At yeah. least that's what I remember. And yeah. that's why there's a picture of Baha'u'llah, I think, from yes. that same city. Right. right. When I was at the um, Race Amity Conference, I found out so much about how Abdul Baha influenced the NAACP. He was invited to go to visit Congress, and he said no. And instead, he went to four meetings of the NAACP. Wow. And the leader of the NAACP, when Abdul Baha died, said that he was one of the champions of race amity. And he helped to sculpture some of the attitudes of the NAACP. Google Abdu'l-Bahá and the NAACP. He was a pen pal to Alexander Grand Bell because it touched his heart why Alexander Grand Bell invented the telephone. Yeah, it was to help his wife 
ear. Yeah, it was. Oh, she had a hearing deficiency, and he was working yeah. on ways to improve her hearing. That's in Redmond's book. Abdul Baha in their midst, and and it's so good because he's dogged in his research. So he'll say such and such diary, and then he looks for that section of the diary and puts it in the book, so that you can read the actual words instead of describing it or just referencing it. He gives you the actual readings of the people that is it's referenced to, and that just adds an extra level of intimacy, of getting known Abdul Baha to read these accounts from people who are not Baha'is. These are not Baha'is. These are the people in this country who were kind of sort of looking at Abdul Baha and saying, who is this man? Yeah. And developing relationships with him. And standing in line to see him. Yeah. Even through Zoom, the energy of Abdul Baha was there. So if that was your goal, you achieved it. Yeah, very good. Thank you.